Ciao, paisanos! My name is Mike. It's me, the Bored Cyborg. Today I'm taking a look at a childhood favorite of mine, a misunderstood film. A film I watched way too much as a child, and probably too much as an adult. The film? Super Mario Brothers: The Movie. The 90s were such a great time to grow up. Not only do we have the best cartoons, the greatest action movie heroes, and the coolest video games ever made, but we also sat at the advent of video game movies. All of the movies that everyone shares contempt for now, I absolutely adored in a time before internet trolls and people refusing to have fun with these types of films. I incessantly watched films like The Wizard, Double Dragon, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, and yes, Super Mario Brothers, the movie. In regard to the Mario video games, I've been playing them for as long as I can remember, literally since I was three years old. And even though I watched Super Mario Brothers, the movie, a hundred times as a kid, watching it as an adult is always an otherworldly experience. It's a film that doesn't quite feel like it was created in our universe, or dimension, if you will. And every time you watch it, it feels as if you step into another realm of existence. There had been movies about video games all throughout the 80s with films like Tron, War Games, and the aforementioned The Wizard, which was essentially a feature-length Nintendo commercial that I still love to this day. But this was the first attempt at adapting a video game into a live-action feature film. And out of all the action-heavy video games they could have chosen from, Castlevania, Contra, Metroid, Mega Man, Bubble Bath Babes. Bubble, bubble Bath Babes? No. They decided to hire the guy and gal that created Max Headroom, Rocky Morton, and Annabelle Jenkel as directors and make a movie out of the video game that makes the least amount of logical sense. Super Mario Brothers. And I am eternally grateful. The first thing we hear as Light Motive's rainbow-colored logo pops up is the only instance in the entire film where Mario music plays. In this case, it's the theme. It's an ever so slightly cinematic rendition of the classic 8-bit chiptune theme that everyone and their grandmother recognizes. As the film begins, we're treated to an animated sequence that looks like it was drawn in Mario Paint by someone that doesn't have any hands. It shows Brooklyn, 65 million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the land and discussed how grand life was. You know, it just don't get no better than this. Yeah. Homer Simpson explains that when the meteor hit and the dinosaurs were wiped out, it split the universe into two parallel dimensions. One where the apes rose from the rubble caused by the meteor strike, eventually evolving into humans, and another where the dinos escaped to, where they eventually evolved into humans. The setup is absolutely ridiculous, but I also think it's imaginative and fun, and I think it's a soundly absurd fantasy concept. You know what they say, man. I mean, you gotta, you gotta live, man, you know? Our story begins. A giant egg is dropped off at a church, and a seemingly human baby hatches from it. We then cut to present-day Brooklyn, 1993, where we meet our valiant heroes. No, no, it's not a big problem. Just leave it to the professionals. When I looked around, I was... I was somewhere else. Mario is played by the venerable British screen legend Bob Hoskins, who is best known for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where he plays Eddie Valiant. And Luigi is played by a baby-faced John Leguizamo, who is best known for... Well... The Pest? You ever wonder if the Mario in Mario Brothers refers to Mario and Luigi's surname? Me neither. Name! Right Mario. Last name. Mario. Okay, what's your name? Luigi. Luigi, Luigi? No, Luigi Mario. Putting a nail in a coffin that was never even opened in the first place. I like the two of them together, and they do have some chemistry. It's maybe chemistry that you would find in a high school science class, but it's there. I read multiple times that the pair hated the production and were usually loaded up on whiskey while shooting, which only adds to the intoxicating nature of the film. That was corny. They both put enough into their respective roles and it at least looks like they're having fun, and that's all that matters. I'm gonna break every bone in their body, and then I'm gonna kill them. I'm really gonna kill them. Jesus Christ. Mario's out for f***ing blood. Forget Mario Mario, more like Mario Rambo. The Mario brothers are having a hard time finding work because their rivals, the greasy, mob-owned... Scapelli. They beat us to it again! Another lost job! Then we meet the female lead character, Daisy, played by Samantha Mathis, who later turns out to be Princess Daisy from Super Mario Land on the Game Boy. Sure. 
Why not? She's also the child that was born from the egg at the beginning of the film. At birth, she was entrusted with a shard of the dreaded meteorite that split the universe and is also what Koopa and his goons are after. He needs it to merge the two worlds and achieve dominion over both. Daisy is a paleontology student at NYU who is currently digging underneath the Brooklyn Bridge to find dinosaur fossils. The kind-hearted Scapelli Kingpin threatens to murder the f out of Daisy if she doesn't relocate from their construction site by night's end. You know, a lot of girls have been going missing in Brooklyn lately. I'd be careful. This is about the time where Daisy meets up with the Mario Brothers. Daisy learns that the Scapellis have sabotaged her dig site. But luckily for her, Mario and Luigi are the best plumbers in town. Well, at least Mario is. Well, I don't know exactly what to do! Mario! Scapellis flooding the site! We need your help! A couple of goons from the alternate dimension, who Daisy thinks are actually Scapellis, kidnap her right underneath the bros' noses. <laughs> These two are Iggy and Spike, two arbitrarily chosen bad guys from the Mario games. They say it's dark. Don't blow it this time. These guys are great, and we later learn that they're not only Koopa's henchmen, but they're also his family members. They're played by Fisher Stevens from Hackers and character actor Richard Edson, whose face I guarantee you have seen before. These two spend the first half of the film with the intelligence of a paper bag filled with rocks. How many times have we got this wrong? You've gotten it wrong five times. Oh, for five, oh, for five. What percent is that? I don't know. And I think they're pretty f***ing funny at points. They even get into some Three Stooges inspired slapstick. I missed. Nice job. Their characters take an interesting turn at the halfway mark as Koopa forcibly evolves them into more intelligent creatures. That hardly seems logical. I suppose that's one way to give your characters an arc. But luckily for us, they're equally as funny in their more sophisticated forms. Oh my. <laughs> Then the film goes all Wizard of Oz as Daisy is pulled into the alternate dino dimension by the goons via a rock wall that isn't quite what it seems. I gotta go with it. Forget it, rock! Look down there! Let's go easy! They enter the Burton-inspired dark fairy tale fantasy realm of the dino, Dino Hatton. You know, like Manhattan, just without the man and with the dino in place of the man. It's kind of brilliant. This world truly captured my imagination as a kid, and still does as an adult kid. I didn't give a shit that it looked nothing like the Mushroom Kingdom. In fact, I don't even think that thought crossed my mind growing up. I think I thought it was okay because it wasn't the game. This world is a well-realized, even more congested feeling, dystopian, cyberpunk version of Manhattan. It's a dark, neon-drenched, fungus-laden, outdoor, concrete shopping mall of towering architecture, innumerable Mario references, and confused extras. It's as if you mainlined acid, then went for a stroll through Times Square while playing Super Mario Land on the Game Boy. Which sounds like my kind of party. <laughs> The production design and art direction is damn good, and there's a damn good reason for that. It was handled by none other than the damn good David L. Snyder. You may not recognize the name, but this is the same man that did the same jobs for motherfucking Blade Runner. Nuff said. It's really a blast watching the brothers sort of stumble about through this alien dimension, learning about the nuances and subtle and not so subtle differences through experience. What is this place? Enter the big bad, the villain, the head honcho, King Koopa. Not Bowser, played by the one and only Dennis f***ing Hopper. Are you from the city? No, I'm from that uh, little part of all of us that can't stand to see someone else in need or in pain. Dennis Hopper played the villain in a couple 90s action-adventure films, uh, Speed and Waterworld, so he really feels right at home here in Super Mario Bros. as he tears at and chews up and spits out the scenery. The scene in which he first meets the brothers has really impressive and imposing lighting and atmosphere as he interrogates the unsuspecting pair. It's obvious that he's having a hell of a time playing the evil, slimy, humanoid dinosaur man, King Koopa. I'll kill that plumber! with de-evolution capabilities. Take these two plumbers to the Devo chamber. The Devo chamber. The Devo chamber. The lost 37th Wu-Tang chamber, the Devo chamber, in which the Wu-Tang clan and Devo join forces to create the greatest album ever made. Maybe it exists in the dino realm. 
We could only hope. What he actually uses the Devo Chamber for is to punish the people of Dino Hatton by devolving them to their Jurassic forms. One thing I cannot stand is naysay. Simon, de-evolve him now. Thus creating these guys, the Goombas from the games, who look exactly like the Goombas from the games. These guys are not only practical, but goofy as fuck. I mean, just look at their dumbfounded, blank expressions. Duh. They not only look great, but they also sound great. And that's because the inimitable Frank Welker provides the voices. You may know him from every fucking animated show from the 80s to present day that includes an imposing character or a monster. He's done it all. So Dennis Hopper really elevates this film to greatness in my mind. He's at the epicenter of the storm of madness. He's the backbone of the Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> Goomba! Yeah. Walk tall, be proud! Go Goomba! I love him. He's great. He bears absolutely no resemblance to Bowser, but that's okay. This is not the game. He does, however, go all out dino during the climax, which is definitely the closest he gets to his video game counterpart. You know you've always been uncomfortable in the human world, and you've at least suspected that you were. That just makes me. Ugh. Ugh. The brothers continue their insane journey through this alternate dimension to save the princess, return the king to his human form, defeat Koopa, and bring peace to both worlds. Hmm. Sort of like in the video game. The true king of the dino realm has been devolved by Koopa to a primordial, ubiquitous, and grotesque fungus that's strewn about the entire city that is actually Lance Henriksen. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did ya? And that reminds me of the film's unofficial tagline, Trust the Fungus. This film's May the Force Be With You. <laughs> which is most definitely not subliminally encouraging psychedelic drug use. The practical effects for the Fungus King are disgustingly effective and always reminded me of a giant, soggy wad of mucusy snot. This film came out the same year as Jurassic Park, a couple weeks before it, in fact, and sits right at the precipice of the transitioning state of Hollywood special effects. And not unlike Jurassic Park, this film does a great job with balancing the practical and the CG effects. Like the impressive, if not somewhat uninspired, dinosaur animatronics, and the sometimes lackluster but always entertaining experimental CG effects. <laughs> In fact, Super Mario Bros. was the first film to put into practice a multitude of groundbreaking digital techniques which are way over my head, so I'm not even going to attempt to explain them. Just take my word for it. My information comes from a rock-solid source. I read it on the internet. Throughout the film, we meet a plethora of reimagined characters from the Mario games, like Big Bertha, the giant fish from Super Mario Bros. 3. But instead of a giant fish out to f*** Mario's day up, she's a giant woman out to f*** Mario. Mario charms her, and the two strike up a cute, fleeting romance as Big Bertha aids and abets them. But not before slow dancing with Mario to a song that sounds like a knockoff of PM Dawn's Set Adrift on Memory Bliss. <laughs> then we have Thwomp, the giant, impassable cinder blocks that impede your progress in Super Mario Bros. 3 and blurt out, ah -uh! But here they're reduced to a pair of futuristic boots that crush anything in their path and allow their bearer to jetpack around the city freely. What about Toad, the sanguine fungi guy that appears in almost every single Mario game? He even makes an appearance as a hippie vagrant guy who plays the guitar and gets arrested for slandering Koopa. The Koopa is coming straight from the underground. And I absolutely adore the little off-the-cuff acoustic tune he sings in strums for the brothers. Got no resources in a great big stupa, all because of the evil king Koopa. Toad's got flow. You know the law, Toad! He's got a cool haircut that sort of resembles the shell of a Lakitu from the games. I could honestly do this forever. You've got a bullet bill appearance. You've got Mario's girlfriend in the film, whose middle name is apparently Pauline. The now playing Boo Diddly sign is a reference to the cutesy little ghost from the Mario series, Boo. The Fungus Squad are clearly shy guys. Countless neon signs that reference Fry Guy, 
Fishbone, Wiggler, and many, many more. Even the bob makes an appearance and saves the day. Non-character reference like the bad guys using SNES super scopes as de-evolution guns. There's a scene that references a moment early on in Super Mario World where Mario bowls with a Koopa shell. And even stage references like the final bridge battle as well as Koopahari Desert. <laughs> It's Cray! Koopa's floating platform is reminiscent of that weird clown mobile majig from the end of Super Mario World. Holy shit! The amount of references crammed into this film, regardless of if they make any sense or not, is impressive. Someone clearly did their homework. It's an awesomely extensive and dense smorgasbord of references from the games. And every single one of them makes me smile like I was six years old again. But the one aspect that really bugs me is the score. It's a shame because Alan Silvestri is a great composer. I mean, he did Back to the Future for Christ's sake. I didn't need the score to echo or reimagine any of the tunes from the Mario games, although that would have been an interesting angle. But what Silvestri brings to the table more so fits films like Problem Child and Beethoven, Homeward Bound, things like that, like family-friendly 90s films. And I think it's technically sound on almost all fronts, despite all of the uh, production woes and the rewrites that we've all read about. I appreciate films like this more and more as time goes by and as I get older, as the movie industry continues to regurgitate the same three ideas over and over and over again. The 90s were a different time, a more innocent time, when studios still took risks. It was really the last bastion of big budget creativity in film. And that's why I love Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets. We need more films like this. Unlike the majority of moviegoers and Mario fans, I'm so glad that this film got made the way it did and with the budget that it got. As a lifelong fan of both the games and the movie, and being at the cusp of Nintendo re-entering the movie industry and giving it another whirl, I can confidently say that nothing like this will ever be made again. And, you know, maybe that's for the better. Now, this film is yet to get a Blu-ray release in the U.S., and that is preposterous. So, what did I do? I tracked down the most glorious version of the film that I could find on Blu-ray, a beautifully produced steelbook version released by Second Sight, which I have right here. Look at that f***ing co- Look at that cover. It's beautiful. Ugh. Oh. The back, it's got a little bob -omb. The inside, not too exciting. And the art on the disc isn't too, uh, too intriguing. But, goddamn, look at that. Mm. Sexy as f <laughs> Anyway, it's a great release with a beautiful transfer and superior sound. Really can't get much better than this, at least for me. It even has some special features, like a couple making of featurettes that are not only insightful, but very entertaining. All in all, I really do love Super Mario Brothers the movie. See you later, alligator! Is it a great film? No, I can't call it that. Is my nostalgia strong with this one? Absolutely. But I do think it's a very good, imaginative fantasy film that's underrated and misunderstood. It's well produced despite the stories of it being a nightmarish production. It's well directed with a similar tone and energy to that of the director's most notable creation, Max Headroom. It's got a good cast that performs well enough, and the film looks and sounds great despite an underwhelming and out-of-place score by Alan Silvestri. Most importantly, it's one hell of an entertaining ride with a great pace and memorable and engaging set pieces. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers the movie was a $40 million science experiment that involved a lot of talented people taking on a project that no one had ever tackled before. Is it the greatest film ever made? No. Far from it, but it may just be the best video game to film adaptation, which I suppose in 2018 still doesn't say much. I know this film has garnered a well-deserved cult following, and I stand shoulder to shoulder with the droves of Super Mario Brothers the movie fans. And I encourage you all to press start and give it another continue. But next time you watch it, do me a favor. Try not to dwell on the fact that you're watching a Super Mario Brothers live action movie. Go into it knowing you'll be getting a darkly humorous fairy tale with a weirdly dystopian alternate dimension with a loony twist on the classic tale of good and evil. It's a strange, one-of-a-kind film that's really in a genre all by itself. Hey, the fungus just saved us. What are you talking about? It was my driving that saved us. And remember, no matter what you do in life, trust the fungus, kids. Trust the fungus. Knock, knock, knock. I just want to thank you guys so much for checking out my 
rather long Super Mario Brothers the movie review. I hope you enjoyed it, whether or not you enjoy the Super Mario Brothers movie. But if you enjoyed the film and have a Region B or All Region Blu-ray player, I encourage you to pick up the Steelbook Blu-ray. Highly recommended. I'm also curious to know what you guys think is the best video game to film adaptation. They come out pretty much every year at this point and there's always a new one in the works and I'm wondering what you guys think is the best one. So just leave a comment below letting me know. If you liked what you saw I encourage you to go ahead and hit the thumbs up button as well as the subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this. What I do is release at least two videos like this a month and I want to try to sneak in a third video here or there, a short film, a video game thing, something out of the order. Ordinary. Also hit that little bell so that you're notified when I do release a new video And if you know somebody that would enjoy this video go ahead and share it with them on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, I don't know if you share on Instagram. I don't know. I'm older now Thanks again guys for checking out this video, and I will see you next time board cyborg out ah!